Russell as Marshal Dan Troop. Amen. And Peter Brown as Deputy Johnny McKay. Amen. Produced by Warner Brothers. Hello, Bill Levy. Welcome to the Juno Files. Hi. Hi. Now, your new book is called Lawman, and it is about the classic television series. It's actually an anthology book about the, the classic TV ster- series starring John Russell and, and Peter Baker, uh, Lawman. Peter Brown. Peter Brown. Peter Brown. I'm sorry, Peter Baker. I don't know where I got that from. Uh, Peter Brown. Yes, and um, but he, they were, uh, John Russell was Marshal Dan Troop. And Peter Brown was his deputy, Johnny McKay. This is a, and for those of you who are not familiar with Lawman, it is airing currently on Stars Encore Westerns every day, Monday through Friday. Tell me a little bit about how, what got you started on this book. Well, for my birthday a year and a half ago, my uh, lady fair gave me the four DVDs. All, so that's all 156 episodes. And after watching them, I decided to contact Ben Omat, who runs the uh, Bear Manor Media. I had written a book for him three, four years ago on the uh, Lest We Forget, the John Ford Stock Company. And I told Ben about it, and I told him that there's a lot of people who really uh, relish it. And he said, do it. So it took me about a year. and Loved it. And there's something about lawmen. I've always liked um, underdogs. I was a special ed teacher for uh, 30 years, and I always go with the underdogs. And lawman is sort of an underdog. It was sort of overshadowed by uh, Gunsmoke. It was overshadowed by some of the other Warner Brothers Westerns, Maverick and Cheyenne. But it was on from 58 to 62, 156 episodes, had pretty good uh, ratings because it went against Ed Sullivan and Steve Allen. Mm -hmm. And over the years, uh, I've spoken to a lot of people who really love the show. They never made a VHS out of it, but now that the DVD is out, and as you said, now that it's on Encore, Stars Encore, there's there's new um, fans. And there's actually on Facebook a, a site run by a woman named Nancy Gale. They have over a thousand, I think she's up to 1,200 passionate members of this lawman site where they're constantly sharing insights about the show. Now, Lawman, like you said, it was a Western. It was produced by Warner Brothers um, to go. And they were, they, um, but it wasn't your normal Western. It wasn't something where somebody goes out and has a morality tale or anything like that. This was a half hour show and definite good, definite bad guys. Uh, more- yeah, um, they didn't really have time to uh, meander all over the place. You had a problem and uh, in that uh, half hour, actually it was 26 minutes, it was resolved. And uh, they did a really good job with it. There was a a producer named Jules Shermer who was there, and uh, he was there for 153 out of the 156 episodes. And uh, he just ran a tight ship, and they, um, he and John Russell and Peter Brown got along very well. And if you remember, Warner Brothers, they uh, were were pretty uh, strict. Let me read you an interesting quote. Uh, Will Hutchins did my introduction. Will Hutchins played Sugarfoot in another Warner Brothers show. And uh, Hutchins said, a note about Warner Brothers and the way we were treated. You may recall that Cheyenne's Clint Walker, Maverick's Jim Garner, 77 Sunset Strip Ed Burns, and Colt 45's Wade Preston each had serious contract differences with the studio. Let me put it this way. The worst gang in the Old West wasn't the James Gang, the Dalton brothers or the Youngers. The toughest gang was the Warner Brothers. They rode us hard and put us away wet. On weekends, they worked us relentlessly from dawn to dark. On weekends, they'd send us out on public appearances and rodeos for which they were paid handsomely and we were paid ugly. 
And the thing about Lawman is with all of this uh, commotion going on, the John Russell and Peter Brown stayed the course of the show. So you had that consistency and it was a very happy set. One component of the book is that I interviewed seven actor, actors and actresses who had actually been in the show and are, are still around and all of them were, uh, would repeat over and over again that Russell and Brown were very professional and it was a happy set. And that makes a big difference. I remember in the book also, you, you describe the Warner Brothers as, I don't want it good, I want it Tuesday. Right, Jack and Warner, I, right. Jack Warner, yes. So Now, John Russell, now he had been on TV before with a TV show called Soldiers of Fortune, but he was also a Western movie veteran also. But he usually played a bad guy in the in the western. Right, I think um, Yellow Sky with uh, Richard Widmark in the late '40s was an example of of those roles. I mentioned in the book that the thing, Russell had a a great stare. He had a chiseled face and body. Um, he looked like a lawman. He looked tough, and the character Dan Troop was a uh, very strong person, but he also had a compassionate side. He would uh, go out of his way to protect the uh, innocent and the, uh, those who uh, were, were in trouble. And uh, he's the only actor who actually was strong enough to stand up against the two icons of Western uh, film history. He, in Rio Bravo, he took on John Wayne, and later on, he took on Clean Eastwood. So uh, he was quite a, a strong character. Yes, and, he, and if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. Now, I know Pale, he was in Pale Rider. That was the one, Pale Rider. That was the one with Clint Eastwood, yes. And, um, and again, he looked like the marshal in that movie, except he wore a black hat instead of a, he always wore a white hat in, uh, right. in the TV show. Um, and he, you know, and unfortunately, you know, he did not, he did not end up, it wasn't a good ending for him in Pale Rider. But, no. yeah, when he, uh, but was he, he going against type when he was cast as Dan Troop? No, they, he had been in a um, Cheyenne episode and he just demonstrated to uh, the producers that he could um, be both a strong protagonist, but also have some empathy. Um, there's lots of comparison with Lawman and uh, Gunsmoke, because of course they each had uh, a lady fair who worked in the uh, saloon. But um, there was just something that he, he could show compassion, um, I think a little bit more than, than Ar Arnest did. Uh, but I just thought that there's just something very, very special about the uh, about Dan Troop. In the book, um, I go to about 25 different uh, sources of asking uh, people who belong to this lawman site and doing readings from different uh, reviews and critiques as to what made it so special, so unique. Why, after 50 years, do people find it relevant? And one of the uh, Continuous answers is Dan Troop, John Russell's work. Now he was um, now he was cast for his work. Um, I guess you would say Soldiers uh, of Fortune was his right. big claim to fame before that. Now tell me a little bit how Peter Peter Brown uh, got got cast. Yeah, Peter Brown um, had signed with one as earlier in '58. And he made three movies, and one of them he had small parts in was called Onion Head. And Jules Sch Schirmer, the producer, liked what he did, brought him in, and he and Russell had good chemistry, and they were there. And he he took Russell took him took him on, mentored him, and helped him to uh, reach his potential. And uh, he, they did very well. It was a father and son type thing. And uh, another thing about lawmen, it, they didn't use gadgets. They didn't have guns and canes and all of that. And they didn't 
get into comedy too often. They basically told their story and, and they told it well. However, there were three episodes with, of all people, Joel Gray. And in one of them, Joel Gray gets dressed up as a miniature lawman. I don't know if you've seen that episode, but it's hysterical. And you can just see Russell and Brown trying to prevent themselves from laughing as um, the Joe Russell character dressed like a miniature Dan Troop is prancing around in the, uh, in the town. <laughs> now, and you mentioned Joel Gray, but a, a lot of people made their appearance, first appearance um, on TV in Lawman, or, or one of their early appearances, we'll put it that way. I remember Robert, I saw Robert Conrad, I didn't even recognize him, because right. I think he was 23 years old, and um, Jack Elam, um, also right. Lee Van Cleef, who would go on to the, uh, to the uh, for a few dollars more, I believe, and, and the good, the bad, and the ugly, of course. So I mean, there were a lot of big names that got their that got their early exposure on that show. Yes, well, Warner Brothers, what they would do is they would take an up and coming um, actor and put him in these different shows, and they just just to test them and see. The very first uh, Lawman show, The Deputy, featured the two bad guys, Lee Van Cleef and Jack Elam. And Ed Burns, Ed Cookie Burns was in that. And that gave him uh, enough exposure that suddenly he was um, starring in 77 Sunset Strip. They did this with a lot of young actors. And at the same time, they brought in a lot of veterans who uh, you'd watch the show and go, wait, there's John Carradine. Hey, wait, there's Wayne Morris. And, uh, and they had a bunch of old cowboy stars too who would make appearance. Hey, that's Bob Steele. Wow. Hey, that's Jack Buttell. My goodness. So it just kept your, uh, your interest very, very much. Now, we mentioned Lawman. This is not your normal Western. And one of the most interesting episodes I've seen so far is when it was a detective story. Um, a showgirl had been murdered, and, they were, and Dan Troop was trying to figure out who killed, who killed her. Um, you know... It, it wasn't afraid to take on, and they weren't afraid to take on like serious issues like post-traumatic stress syndrome or, or things of that nature. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So, I mean, and that was, that was something which wasn't too common in TV back in the 50s, was it? No, no. And as you said, they took on topics that uh, were rare. As you said, the post-traumatic uh, stress disorder uh, was in a show called Battle Scar. Right. They talked about the dangers of using the media to find romance in the catalog woman. Uh, and um, there was uh, domestic violence address. There was uh, uh, juvenile delinquency. There was uh, the use of psychology to promote fear, the danger of modern weaponry. And of course, uh, prejudice and discrimination against minorities. And again, Dan Troop, was a uh, proponent for justice, and he was very protective of uh, minorities and outsiders. Um, so yeah, a lot of that was uh, very, makes it very, very relevant as you watch it today, 50 years later. This, sh I mean, I watch a lot of old TV shows and a lot of them seem dated. Lawman does not seem dated at all. No, and it flows so easily through that half hour, you know, like you said in your book, they don't, or someone in your book, you were quoted that they said, you don't draw the gun unless you intend to use it. Correct. And there's no, there's no, like you said, no special effects, no gimmicks or anything like that. Um, so it, and for a half hour show, that's really rare that they don't get taught, they don't get bogged down in anything like that. Um, let's talk a little bit about the character who appeared in the second season, Lily. Um, you know, she was introduced because, you know, um, the, as a romantic interest to Dan Troop. Uh, the, other two, the other two female leads uh, right. in the first season just weren't working out, so they brought in Peggy Castle. And tell me a little bit about her. Well, she was known as the uh, B-movies Claire Trevor. She played the uh, blonde in a lot of B-movies throughout the uh, 50s. And she... Uh, added so much to that show. It was sort of like she uh, 
she helped melt the glacier that was Dan Troop. And uh, she could be feisty and she could be vulnerable, but, and she could, um, she just added a great deal to the show. The chemistry was there, a beautiful, beautiful girl. And uh, actually, 10 years before, in 1949, they had done a uh, testing with John Russell when he was uh, 26 and she was 21. And then they didn't see each other or work together until uh, the beginning of 1959, the second season. And she really improved the show and their rating that second year, and again, this was against Ed Sullivan and Steve Allen, was fifth, number 15, which was pretty good. It was better than Maverick and Have Gun Will Travel and most of the other Westerns at the time. That's true. I mean, and that's incredible for, for being up against those two powerhouses especially when uh, Steve Allen was having people on there like, well, and Ed Sullivan too, like Elvis Presley. And, right. and you know, this was the glory days of the variety show. Um, let me ask you, I felt sad when I read Peggy Castle's story, though. Um, yes. In, uh, uh, for those of you who don't, who don't realize, she, uh, she didn't do that much work after, after Lawman. No, and, no, she she became an alcoholic, and she only did one one other show afterwards. She did a uh, Virginian in 1966. Um, all three of these main characters, this was the apex of their careers. John Russell never starred in a, uh, a show again, and uh, died of a lingering uh, emphysema uh, at the age of uh, 70 in 1991. Brown never, Peter Brown never became a major star. He was in Laredo a few years later, and he was in the soaps a lot. But um, he died of uh, Parkinson's disease, and he was married five years, five times. Mm -hmm. And um, Peggy Castle, as we just said, um, died of um, alcoholism at a very young age of 45. There's a quote in the book that I used from a Robert, a Robert Malsbury, who wrote a very good book on Walt, uh, Warner Brothers Television. And he said, Lawman was a good show to the end, but Marshall Troop and uh, Johnny McKay learned that being good and dedicated to one's job does not make one immune to the blazing guns of Nielsen. Yes, that's right. And unfortunately, and they became typecast. I mean, right. And there was an oversaturation of Westerns at the time. I mean, in 58, 59, 60, there were so many Westerns. And so, and then there was a movement about the violence. And as Peter Brown said, ABC just wanted to do movies. And they changed the slot. They put them um, on at 10.30 to 11, uh, the last half of uh, 1962 season. And that was, uh, that was the end. Yeah, that was... that. That's a that's a a bad slot to be in, especially on a Sunday night. People getting ready for work the next morning. Right. Um, I got to talk about the song, the theme song. That was that's one of the best theme songs that I've ever heard. Very addictive, and what they did with it is they uh, use it um, in the um, in the show, and they would change the cadence, and they they. They use it to uh, express different emotions, and they, um, it was very, very, it was, it was a part of the show. There's a um, fourth stanza that I found out in researching it that it was never uh, played on the show. So folks could walk through streets unafraid, he would, rock, he would fight for what's right undismayed. When his job was complete, he'd travel on as the lawman. <laughs> I'm going to switch gears on you just a little bit here. You're working on a new, a new book. Uh, it's Meats. Tell me about that. Well, actually, it's the third book. I have third book. written, okay. I've written two of them already. This is one of them here called Meats. Um, meats are speculative fiction uh, dealing with fictitious encounters between celebrities between 1860 and the present, and I'm having a ball with them. The first book had 100 episodes, the second has 100 episodes, and I'm on a roll now, and I'm up to number 24 on the third. And what I try to do is make them historically accurate. For example, Jules Verne came to America once. 
He visited New York City and saw Niagara Falls. So I'm thinking, okay, who was in like Niagara Falls? This was in 1868. And I just put it aside. And then I realized, I found out that Wild Bill Hickok was in, he was going to sort of follow in the footsteps of Buffalo Bill Cody and try to get into acting and do some theater. And so I had the two of them meet and it works out that Jules Verne is going to use his character as like a prototype for the uh, harpooner in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So I get to connect and I have a great time connecting them. And uh, so I've been working on those. I think I shared some with you. Yes. And, uh, I just find it really exciting. The one with Amelia Earhart I really liked. Right. Amelia Earhart is uh, at a uh, state fair, which she actually went to. And she was very impressed with the fire hydrants. And she comes back and she has a, uh, a neighbor, an older lady, uh, who is on the adjacent farm. And she says, well, what about the airplanes? Did you see the airplanes? This was about 1910, 1915. And she said, yeah, but I was more interested in the fire hydrants. And the woman keeps pushing, give the airplanes a chance. Give flight a chance. Flying is really amazing. She said, have you flown? And she says, sort of. And there's some more clues. And it turns out that it's Dorothy from the uh, Wizard of Oz. <laughs> well, I tell you what, Bill, I appreciate you taking time. The book from Bear Manor Media is called Lawman. It is, it is a, I want to say, a, a, you have a synopsis of all 156 episodes in there, plus interviews, recollections of people who were on the show. That was, right. that was really uh, interesting. And, then you've and they just they just came out with the uh, CD for it, and and there is a Kindle edition. So this is coming out, I believe, in September. The uh, CD you can check oh, yeah. you can check and see that the Lawman book is in uh, hardcover and soft cover, and, uh, and because we have that uh, that Facebook site, it, it, every every all of them are buying it, and it's wonderful. Yeah, so we're really having a good time sharing it, and I just. Um, as, as I said before, they never made a VHS out of it, but now with the DVD and with uh, cable encore, more and more are getting a chance to see really an, an exceptional show. Well, Bill, thanks again for being on the Juno Files today. Thank you, babe. Thank you. <laughs>